Common Sense Radio, The Michael Duke Show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, another beautiful day out here as we uh, try and bring it to you every day, four hours, or excuse me, two hours, five times a day, five times a week, yeah, whatever it is. It's 20 hours a week. Do the math. Come on. It's the new math. Uh, it is The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio for the World. Thanks for uh, tuning in and joining us. Today's guest uh, on the program from the Campaign for Liberty is uh, David Giesel, and he is here at my invitation to talk about something that I feel uh, pretty strongly about and I think would be kind of a cool thing to discuss, uh, and that is real money, sound money, uh, money that actually has some value to it as opposed to the paper that you currently carry in your wallet, which uh, basically says, in God you trust, everybody else pays with gold. And uh, so uh, joining me right now is uh, David Giesel. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for coming in. Now, of course, uh, for those of you who are familiar to KFAR, you probably know that David uh, hosts a show, uh, co-hosts a show on Saturday, uh, 10 a.m., uh, Patriots Lament, where they talk about a lot of this stuff. And, and I actually, some of our phone calls earlier this week may have actually come out of, I guess you guys talked about sound money this weekend. So that may be where some of the interest came. And so I thought we'd uh, we'd come back here and discuss it. Um, they were We were talking about yesterday, David, I don't know if you were listening to the program, we were talking about... Um, uh, people were talking about, well, what Alaska really needs is Alaska really needs some of their own coins and some of their own money, you know, real gold. You know, I've had people talk to me before about, you know, coinage backed with gold or coinage backed with actual oil or some of those other things. Let's talk about real money. What, what, how did we get where we're at today? What, 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 is the, what is the genesis of this whole deal? Okay, well, I have uh, I have my little sticky note. This is this is all the notes that's I have. That's your cheat so sheet. Okay. That's my cheat sheet. So we really have to start with a, hi- a history of money, right? What is money? That's the fundamental question. So um, basically the way money emerged is you had people trading commodities, the goods. You had, say, a wheat farmer and a fisherman. And the wheat farmer has a bunch of wheat, but he doesn't have any fish, and the fisherman has fish but no wheat. And so they can exchange, right? They can decide, I'll trade you two bushels of wheat for however many fish or whatever. Right. And so that's a barter economy. But the problem is, what if the uh, guy who grows wheat wants fish and the fisherman doesn't want wheat? Well, then what did they do? They have to find a third commodity that they can both agree on to exchange. And so... So money would naturally emerge in, you know, around the world it emerged in all different civilizations as the most commonly traded commodity. It was it was the commodity that the most people put trade value in. Right. And so some places this was shells, some places it was gold or silver coins. Um, it could be all sorts of things. Um, but in most places it emerged to be uh, gold and silver. And so this was just, money is basically just a, it's another commodity. It's no different than any commodity you're buying. It's subject to supply and demand. It has a price and its price fluctuates on the market. Right. Um, so, so money emerged naturally. And then as people foolishly created states, they decided that they would give states the ability to control the money, or rather the states took control of that, because the idea was, well, money is, is being the most important commodity, the most commonly traded commodity. It's far too important to leave in the hands of the market, right? We must take control of it. And so states took control of money, and they started using gold and silver, because that's what was already being used. So they'd start with that. They'd say, well, we're just going to put our face on a coin that you're already using, no problem. And and then slowly they would shrink the size of the coin, and mandate that it still be traded for the same value so that the state would would get the coins it would get the the free market gold and silver out of circulation remint it at a lighter weight with with their king's face on it and then by law use that coin to buy a fixed amount of goods uh, from so it's society. basically depreciation by the government right and, and that was called coin clipping um, a king would would say okay you know I'm going to have a, a unit of uh, purchasing power I'm going to make a gold coin and it's going to be like one ounce and you can use it in trade, and it's good for your taxes and all this stuff. So he would tax people a one-ounce coin. He would get one ounce, and then he would clip the corners of the coin. It'd be a round coin. You'd clip it into, like, an octagon or something. You'd just clip the edges off. So then it's nine-tenths of an ounce, and the king would spend that back into circulation, but he would demand the same amount of goods that he got for the one-ounce coin. And so through this process, you had kind of an early form of monetary inflation. And the Romans did the same thing. They started watering down the silver content of their coins, and their silver content went from... Um, 0.999, they were trading basically fine silver coins, all the way down to zero, where the coins were coppered, and they just had a, a hint of silver, and that was the end of the Roman Empire, basically. So in the United States, there's a, sort of a similar monetary history. Um, the colonies, the primary coin that was traded was the Spanish dollar, and uh, the Spanish dollar was um, seven, or it was 300 
71.25 grains of fine silver. That's just what it happened to be. Right. And it was it was convenient to trade because you had the Spaniards were taking all the silver back and forth from South America, and so that's just what emerged, and people just used it. There was no law saying that this is what you have to use. Um, it was just what emerged. And people had scales, and they'd weigh the coins and make sure they were of valid weight. And so that was that was the money that was being used. So after the Revolutionary War, um, Thomas Jefferson and, and some of the founders looked around, and they said, what's... What should we have as our money for the United States? Or what should the United States say is money? And they said, well, the most commonly used thing is the is the Spanish dollar, and it weighs this amount of silver, so we'll just say that that's a dollar, right? And the dollar was defined to be that unit of weight. It was defined to be 371.25 grains of silver. That's all it meant. And so, and people held the silver in their hands just like they hold the commodity. So the value of the money in that society was in everybody's hands who was exchanging the money. Right. And the only the only role of the of the government was to say uh, dollar coins must weigh this amount. So so yeah. So they weren't minting. They weren't taking care of it. They basically just provided the definition for what one dollar was, which That's, was basically a, a a weight of this precious metal, silver. Right. So it was, it was a weight of some commodity. You know, right. it'd be like you could you could make it a barrel of oil or a bushel of wheat or whatever. Right. Six, six, six pounds reasons, of ham or reasons, whatever. Yeah, right. yeah, there's reasons to use precious metals. Um, they have high high density, high value density. They don't corrode, um, especially gold doesn't corrode. Uh, so there's reasons that it's that metals emerge instead of other things. But yeah, they the the purpose of saying that a dollar was this weight of silver was just to um, provide a, a universal unit of exchange and to weed out fraud. That was it. And so there was no control of the value of that silver by the government. The value of the coin was determined in the market um, through prices, right? I right. say, I'm, I'm selling, you know, I'm going to sell you a wagon and I want this many silver coins. And so, so all of the control over prices, including the price of money, was left in the hands of the people. They had absolute control over all of the money in the United States. The government had no control over it. And so if they didn't if they didn't want to pay their taxes, for example, and they withheld their silver coins, that was it. The government didn't have any wealth. The wealth was in the hands of the people. So ultimate power was in the hands of the people because they held the money and they held the value of that money, which right. was the commodity itself. And so and that that was crucially important because money is half of every transaction. When you go to the store and buy something, you're trading money on the one half of the transaction for the goods that Safeway or Fred Meyer or whoever has on the other side of the transaction. And so if the government takes control of money, they've immediately taken control of half of the economy, at least. So that was the uh, that was the big deal with, with uh, gold or silver money or commodity money. And over time, of course, well, actually right from the beginning, uh, to fight the Revolutionary War, um, they didn't have enough well, they didn't think they had enough money to win the war. So they printed these notes that were promises to pay a certain amount of silver. Redeemable for an actual, real... They, yeah, they were supposedly redeemable. There was a promise to pay. Right. right. Promissory notes. And these were called Continentals. And all the patriotic Americans went out and bought Continentals to, to finance the uh, the war. But, of course, the the uh, British loyalists did not... They weren't particularly patriotic or anything. And so they held on to their silver. And so it turns out, of course, as always happens when government gets the power to print money, that they printed more Continentals than they had silver for. So after the war, people were holding these Continental notes that were promises for certain weights of silver, and they went to the government to redeem them, and the government said, well, we don't have any silver, sorry. And so the, the most patriotic Americans, of course, lost their shirt right from day one, you know, uh, 1776. So the uh, the founders, except for... Uh, Alexander Hamilton all looked around at this and said, "Well, you know, paper money is a bad idea, and so we have to we have to constitutionally mandate that money will be a specific weight of of silver and nothing else, right? And so that's what they did. And the authority to print or the authority to make money to coin was left entirely up to the states. They said the states are the only ones who have the authority to make coinage." Right, or or they can make coinage. You know, private banks can make coinage too. Right. But the states must enforce that a dollar is this weight of silver. They decide what is actual legal tender. Is what. Kind uh, of... Yeah, well, yeah. It wasn't even, yeah, it wasn't even necessarily legal tender in the sense we think of it today. It was just if somebody makes a coin and it says dollar on it, it must contain this weight of silver. And so banks made silver coins, and and the U.S. government made silver coins, and states made silver coins. And so that's that's all it was. It was an agreement in the Constitution that the states between themselves would agree on the same weight of silver to, to facilitate trade. Uh, but, of course, um, people forget the purpose of that. And so, again, when you had a, a big war in the United States, you have the Civil War. And 
you can't you can't fight wars with uh, with hard money. That's another or sound money. That's another thing because the the purchasing power is in the hands of the people. And in war, you're always trying to get the the government, whoever the government is, is always trying to get one group of people to kill another group of people. And of course, they stand no incentive. There's no economic incentive to kill someone else. Uh, and so, if the people hold the value of their money, the government can't push them into fighting. So, of course, during the Civil War, you had uh, Lincoln issuing the greenbacks, which were just like the Continentals. They were a redeemable, supposedly, paper note with a promise to pay a certain amount of silver. Right. And he issued a bunch of them, and they financed the war with those. And after the war, the people who had them couldn't get their money back because they'd printed too many. And so so that system collapsed, and it went back to a, to a silver money standard. So, and at that at that point in time, there was there was uh, what was called bimetallism, where um, you had a fixed ratio. The government had decided that gold and silver would be legal tender uh, through through legal tender laws at that point, and that there would be a fixed ratio between gold and silver at 15 to one. So, 15 ounces of silver was equal to one ounce of gold, and one ounce of gold was one twentieth of a dollar. So, 20 uh, 20 dollars would buy you an ounce of gold if you took a 20 dollar bill down to the to whatever bank, your state bank or whatever, they would hand you an ounce of gold. Right. That's why they had, again, the $20 gold eagles, right? That kind of thing. That was right, a exactly. One ounce, yeah, and, one a half, ounce. and a half eagle was a $10 coin. And, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that's where those weights come from. And then a, a silver dollar was 0.77 ounces of silver. And that those ratios all work out. So it's it's a 15 to 1 ratio. Um, anyway, so so the United States reverted back to a, a hard money system again after, after the war. Um, just like, well, very similar to what happened in the Revolutionary War. So then time marches on, and then we have uh, Woodrow Wilson and World War One, and yet you know yet again uh, there's a war that they want to fight, and you can't you can't afford to fight an imperialist war unless uh, you have fiat money because the people won't support it, they won't squander their wealth to go and die. So you have uh, you have the uh, issuance of the or you have the Federal Reserve Act, right, which came into existence in 1913. And the Federal Reserve Act was, it was the third bank, it was sort of the third chartered bank of the United States. There was a, a, first, national, or a first, first national bank and then a second national bank, and both of those, um, they basically destroyed their own currency because right. they, couldn't, they couldn't redeem. And so the Federal Reserve was the third attempt at this. And uh, the Federal Reserve would give the government basically authority to control the value of money yet again. It would take the control of the value of money out of the hands of the people. And it would take the value of the actual circulating money out of the hands of the people and place it in the government's hands. So at which point, um, refusing to pay taxes, you know, the ultimate nullification was taken away from the people. And so the Federal Reserve Act was passed. And in parallel with that, we have the 16th Amendment, which is, of course, the income tax. Right. Right. And the income tax exists solely because of the Federal Reserve. That is the only reason the income tax exists. The IRS is basically the collection wing of the Federal Reserve. That's what it does. It, it takes your money and gives it to the Federal Reserve. Your roads are paid th- for through gasoline taxes. The military was at that point paid for um, by export taxes. Um, schools and things like that were paid for by property tax and still are. The, the IRS income tax goes to the Federal Reserve. It is their profit. Um, and that profit doesn't need to exist if you have sound money. The only reason that profit needs to exist is because the Federal Reserve uh, loans out money at interest to the government. So, so basically, the, the Federal Reserve comes into existence in 1913, and you have people trading gold and silver coins, and the Federal Reserve starts making promissory notes, right? Federal Reserve notes, and they promise to pay that same amount of gold or silver. So everyone's comfortable with this, right? A federal, twenty dollar Federal Reserve note, I can still go and redeem it for a twenty for a twenty dollar gold piece. Right. So there's no change, right? It's fine. Um, and so they start they start printing these notes. And they print more and more and more of them. And this fuels essentially the Roaring Twenties. You have this inflationary boom in the Twenties where the Federal Reserve is flooding the market with money, much like we had in uh, up until 2007 with the housing boom. And uh, so people are borrowing money and financing these projects and, you know, the, the Roaring Twenties. And so that comes to a, to a screeching halt in uh, 1929, of course, uh, when people go to so – some people got an idea that maybe more money has been issued than there's gold. And so they go to redeem, and the banks don't have the gold because there's more paper in existence than there is gold. And so there's a banking collapse, uh, very similar to the Continentals not being redeemable at the end of the Revolutionary War or the Greenbacks not being redeemable at the end of the Civil War. 
only this time you have the Federal Reserve in place. And so what the Federal Reserve does, well, it, it takes a few years, but through FDR, um, what the Federal Reserve does is they decide that they will simply, in order to cover up all this extra money they've created, they'll just revalue what the dollar is. So instead of being a 20th of an ounce of gold, they'll turn it into a 35th of an ounce of gold, right? So instead of uh, $20 to buy an ounce of gold, they'll just change the price to 35. So then they can cover up, you know, they've created all this extra money and they have a fixed amount of gold, but then it becomes redeemable. And yeah, wasn't, uh, I mean, wasn't Roosevelt at the same time, wasn't he also monkeying around with the actual uh, setting the prices of gold itself? Or is that... I mean, yeah, that- well, they, they were, right, there was uh, there was sort of some, some gold price fixing, Um there was uh, – what was the monetary system? It was the gold exchange standards, what the monetary system was called. And so you had the United States and Great Britain. They were they were the ones who held uh, – they issued paper notes that were promises to pay gold. And then all the other Western European nations issued notes that were based on those notes. Right. So you have gold as real money right. that the banks hold. And then you have Federal Reserve notes and Bank of England notes, which were promises to pay that. And then you have um, like French francs and German marks and things like that. Right. And these were based on either pounds, sterling, or uh, or dollars. Right. So anyway, so so the Federal Reserve does this through Roosevelt. And in 1933, what they what they did is they confiscated all the gold. And there was the uh, the Gold Confiscation Act of 1933, and that was a um, that act said that if you held gold eagles or or silver dollars or whatever, well, not silver dollars, but gold eagles or gold double eagles, you had to take them down to your bank and turn them in for paper. You had to take your gold and give it to the Federal Reserve and take their paper. Right. And, of course, most people didn't do this. They said, sounds like a sounds like a raw deal. The government's telling me to turn in my gold. I don't think I'm going to do it. So they only, they only got a couple percent of the gold coins out of circulation. And... So they, that was a they had there was like a three month window where you were allowed to go and do this and then you were a, an outlaw after that. Uh, most people just stashed the coins away. So after that was over, they revalued gold. They said, well, now the dollar is one thirty fifth of an ounce of gold. And so effectively, they were able to cover up their inflation just by redefining what a dollar was. Um, and so this is kind of like coin clipping. A king would say, my sovereign coin is going to be one ounce. Then he would clip it down to half an ounce, right, and say, well, it's still my sovereign coin. You still have to give me the same amount of goods for it. That's what the U.S. government did in 1933. And they actually, gold was illegal to own from 1933 till 1974. Uh, people don't realize that it was illegal to own gold in the United States for a very long period of time. And they dismiss that as an impossibility, but it's actually already happened here. So so they did that, uh, and they... They reissued that. So then you just have you just have uh, Federal Reserve notes, right, and silver coins. Those were the only right. two things in existence. Gold had been removed. Um, and so that, that system goes on for a while. There was, uh, you know, throughout the Depression, there were all these uh, social programs and more, more debt created and more inflation. Uh, but it really wasn't, it wasn't that bad of a scenario. Uh, then you fast forward to World War II. It, and during World War II, yet again, you have a war... Nations can't pay for war unless they print money, right? They can't do it with hard money. That was how, uh, actually, the the mark was pulled off of the gold standard. Then they issued paper marks, the Germans, in order to fund the war. And had the other Western European nations not taken those paper marks, the Germans would have never been able to build up their military. Had they had they demanded gold right. instead of paper, uh, World War II would have never happened. And that goes back in part to what I mean. You say that you know no wars can be fought on 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 real sound money. Right. Uh, and that's always one of the arguments against uh, you know some kind of sound money policy. Well, there's only so much there's only so much, and you can't really expand, and you can't really. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, like you said, because again, it's it's a it's a fictitious way to get credit. Basically, is what they're doing is they're they're dubiously. Uh, manufacturing their own inflationary credit right there at, on the spot. Well, yeah, at the expense of, of everybody else. When the king right. clipped the coins, he had more gold and the peasants had less. And our governments today, every government in the world is on is on a paper money or a, what's called a fiat money system, which right. is fiat means money by decree. And so it's not just that the money doesn't have some precious metal in it. It's that the government mandates that you use it by law or they will put you in jail. Um through that system, they can they can, you know, sophisticatedly clip the coins. They're constantly stealing the value of what you earn, but without you knowing about it because of all these banking techniques and and subtle things. All right, so we're getting into World War II here, and when we get back, we will come out of World War II and find out where we uh, are and how we got to where we are today. 
We're talking with David, D- uh, David Giesel. He's from the Campaign for Liberty. We're talking about sound money, what we call real money, and uh, what it means to us today and, and why do we need to get back to it. Uh, don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show continues. Uh, we're back with more right after this. Fox News Radio is up next on the Heartbeat of Alaska. And we're back. The Michael Duke Show. Thanks for joining us. David Giesel is our guest. He's from the Campaign for Liberty. And we've been talking about sound money, real money. And before we went to the break, we had just entered World War II. And uh, David was talking about what was being done at that time to try and, uh, I guess, suck as much actual value actual value out of the money as possible. Uh, David, where, is that where we're at right yeah, now? Yeah, so far, so far they'd made it illegal for Americans to own gold. They had devalued the dollar from one twentieth of an ounce of gold to one thirty fifth of an ounce of gold. Right. And they had printed uh, far more paper notes than they could ever redeem, even at that value. So then that takes us through through the Great Depression. They did that. So that takes us into uh, World War II. And so during World War II, basically all of the industrial nations of the world, except the United States, got wiped out, uh, mostly because we have an ocean on either side. Right. So. After World War II, they had this monetary agreement called the Bretton Woods Agreement. And it's because they met at uh, Bretton Woods in, in New York somewhere. And what they agreed is the, the U.S. had the most gold of, of any nation in the world after World War II. That's what Fort Knox was all about. And so since the U.S. held all this gold and the U.S. notes were promised to pay one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold per dollar, right. everybody said, we'll just stack our money on top of yours. We'll, we'll treat the, the U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve note, um, as gold, and then the British pound will be pegged to gold, and the and the Germ or the uh, yeah the German mark will be pegged to gold, and the uh, French franc will be pegged to gold or pegged to the dollar rather, which was then pegged to gold. And so you have gold as the base money, and then you have dollars, and then you have all the other currencies of Western Europe um, built on top of dollars. Right, and that's right. what and the, that's how the dollar came to be known as the world reserve currency. Exactly. Right. right. And so that's that's what that meant. And so. But it was still illegal for U.S. citizens to hold gold because uh, the government, any government in the world, always oppresses its own citizens more than foreigners. Uh, I think that's an axiom, actually. But anyway, uh, so a dollar was still defined to be one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold, uh, but you could not go and redeem your notes for that. But foreign governments could, and so as money circulated between, uh, you know, around the world, basically dollars would accumulate in, uh, say. England to buy, I don't know, MGs or something like that. You're buying a British sports car. And so then the the owner of that factory has to buy something from the United States and spend their dollars. Right. Uh, But if they don't want to buy something from the United States, they could take their foreign, their U.S. dollars that were overseas and take them to the Federal Reserve Bank and get gold at 135th of an an ounce per dollar. And so that was the Bretton Woods Agreement. And that was kind of a, a... pseudo gold standard and then pounds were pegged to gold at a certain fixed ratio and all these other things but there were no uh there was no logical or or legal restriction on any of these countries from just printing extra money and and promising that the u.s would pay for it right and there was no restriction on the u.s from printing more from printing more federal reserve notes and and redeeming and so after world war ii you have um all these little interventions. There was the, the Red Scare, right? So we, we had the Korean War. We had the Vietnam War. We have LBJ's Guns and Butter. Um, and all this spending, right? And the military-industrial complex emerges, as Eisenhower tells us. So there's all this government spending, the, the moon mission, right? And But the U.S. wasn't mining more gold, right? There was no more gold in the U.S. They were just printing more dollars to pay for all this and promising everybody that they would pay. And since American citizens couldn't redeem their dollars in gold, there was no check domestically on the printing of money. But foreigners could. So what happened was U.S. dollars started accumulating in Europe. And European countries, specifically France, said, hey, you know, we don't think you can actually give us gold for all of our dollars anymore. We think you've printed too much money. Because we're holding too many dollars, right. We're yeah. holding more dollars than you say, than you than you had gold, you know, back at the end of World War II. And so the, the French started redeeming all of their paper dollars in gold. And the gold outflows from the U.S. Uh, went through the roof. I mean, there was massive amounts of gold leaving uh, the Federal Reserve. And uh, so in 1971, uh, on a very fateful day, August 15th, 1971, Richard Nixon... Um, closed the gold window 
so-called, right? And that means that he made the dollar completely irredeemable. He told all the foreigners who held dollars, yesterday you could redeem your dollars for gold, today you can redeem them for nothing, right? That was actually the default of the United States. We talk about the debt ceiling and, oh, right, we, right. we can't default. We defaulted on uh, August 15th, 1971. And the price of gold as has you know, the, the dollar was defined to be one thirty fifth of an ounce of gold. So an ounce of gold in 1971 cost $35 if you were lucky enough not to be a U.S. citizen so you could legally buy it. By the end of that decade in 1980, the price of gold was $880 an ounce, right? So so they said, oh, we're going to – well, Milton Friedman was actually somebody who said, oh, we don't need to redeem in gold, right? Gold is just holding the economy back. We have these smart people who can manage the economy, um, and manage these fiat currencies, and we'll, we'll all be better off. He said, when the U.S. abandons gold redeemability, um, the price of gold will drop to below $5 an ounce. And the price of gold never dropped. It went from $35 an ounce straight up to 880 <laughs> and then it pulled back. There was a In 1980, there was a big pullback because uh, uh, Paul Volcker increased interest rates, and he pulled a bunch of inflation out of the economy, all the inflation from the 70s. So the price of gold ended up pulling back to $250 an ounce. But still... Over a decade, $35 an ounce to $250 an ounce, that's still an eight-fold increase. Right. And right. so the value of the value of people's dollars from 1971 to 1981 decreased by a factor of eight. Right? They lost they lost eight times their purchasing power. If they had money in the bank, they could buy eight times less stuff with their cash at the end of the decade than at the beginning. Uh, and and nobody really realized what was going on because uh, they weren't allowed to redeem in gold until well, in 1974 they were allowed to redeem again, or you were allowed to you were allowed to purchase gold. It was legal to hold gold. Right. Um, but it was irredeemable at that point. You couldn't go down to the Federal Reserve and get it. You had to buy it at the market price, and the market price was no longer $35 an ounce. So that happened. Uh, that was the so that was the closing of the gold window, and that's the system we're on now. That's the dollar reserve standard, where there is no gold, there is no oil, there is no commodity that backs any paper. The Federal Reserve prints these magical notes, or they create them electronically, and all other currencies in the world are based on those notes, or exchange at some at some rate. Some like the euro clears at a market rate, right? Which means that it's a floating exchange rate, whereas the Chinese yuan is pegged. It's 0.15 uh, dollars per yuan, and so it's the floating exchange standard. But none of the currencies in the world have anything behind them. If you take a $20 bill down to the Federal Reserve and you say, "I want to redeem this," they give you $21 bills. Right, they don't give you an ounce of gold anymore. Right, and so what is that? You know, brings us the question: What is money worth today? Well, it's it's worth whatever it will buy, right? But that's, I mean, that's at the whims of, uh, you know, basically of of the market. And the only reason that the market still uses dollars is because they're mandated to by law. Whenever a competing currency it tries to emerge like the the Liberty Dollar or something like that. Right. We talked about our, that earlier. Our wonderful free market government goes in and seizes their precious metals and locks them in a cage because they they know that if any if any sort of free market money could could compete whether it's backed by gold and silver or not if any sort of free market money were allowed uh, their fake money system would collapse and that's how they've confiscated the wealth of the people is through their money system and without that they can't do anything all this all of the Federal stuff that we talk about nullifying and all of that, uh, it's all based on their money system. If you don't go after the money system, fundamentally, if you don't go after the Federal Reserve, forget any of the other issues. Just forget about them. It's not even worth talking about them. So so the heart of the problem, basically, with Western civilization right now and all the debt and, and the spending and the wars and the social uh, upheavals and all this stuff that you see in Europe is because there is no redeemability for money. The the power to control half of the economy, the power to control the value of money, has been taken out of the hands of the people. And uh, you, you mentioned the Liberty Dollar. For those of you who aren't familiar with what he's talking about, it was um, Bernard von Nothaus. He he started a foundation or a corporation that was basically the Liberty Dollar Corporation, and you basically would deposit money. And he had a vault. He had a bank or a vault in Texas, and they deposited precious metals. Uh, there, uh, he had redeemable notes that were, he printed his own notes that were redeemable for gold or precious metals. Uh, they actually had coinage, uh, silver coinage, and he had convinced something like 1,200, I think it was in 1,200 different cities, municipalities and businesses. He had conditioned them and got them to the point where they would accept Liberty. I still have a Liberty dollar in my bag right here, $10 Liberty dollar coin. Uh, he'd conditioned them to accept it as 
Money. I yeah. mean, it's real money. It's just, yeah, I mean, money is just a commodity that's used in right. exchange. So so people can select whatever they want. So, yeah, in a free market, and that's that was the premise he was operating on, is there's no law that says I can't issue my own money, as long as I don't call it a U.S. dollar. Right. Right. There's actually no law in the books that says I can't exchange what I want. And as know? long as the businesses agree to take it as money, right. it's, it's a voluntary, all good. Right. It's a voluntary exchange. Yeah. Um, but... They, uh, it came down and laid the smack down on they him. They laid the smack down on him, and they and they stole all of his medals. $12 million is right. what they had in there worth of precious medals in that vault down there. Right. Um, it's uh, you know it's just a crying shame uh, that that, uh, that kind of stuff went down. Um, so that leads us, gives us the history, listen to where we are today. And I got a phone call here. I, I want to take some calls here for you. Uh, but yesterday, like I said, day before, we were talking about why don't we as a state – uh, coin some of our own money. I mean, Utah has already passed something. Idaho, I know, has talked about passing something where they have their own currency. Now, the Constitution says that Congress has the Congress has the authority to to mint coins, uh, so on and so forth. But the states have the ability to declare what is legal tender. Is that in my, uh, my yeah? Well, the Congress has the authority to uh, regulate the value thereof, and what that meant at the time. If if you read the Constitution, you have to read it in context with a dictionary from the late 18th, right. 18th century. Uh, what that meant was we will decide what the weight of a dollar is in silver, and so they did. That's what that's what that meant. Um, and so then that that was binding on the states only in that if Alaska made a dollar, it would have to be. 371.25 grains of silver, right? And if California made a dollar, it would have to be the same weight just to facilitate So that you could trade, trade them back and forth, Just basically. to facilitate trade, right? Which we don't even need anymore because we have we have all sorts of uh, market clearing mechanisms. We can trade gold online digitally, right? And just change the ownership in a digital account. That's uh, Goldmoney.com does that. And so that, that even that um, is redundant now. The reason they had to do that back then was because information traveled slowly and it was cumbersome to weigh all this bullion and all this. Right, right. But with computer accounting we have now, you don't even need that, that mandate anymore. If you just, if you said there's no legal tender, people can use whatever they want. Some money would emerge, you know, the banks would compete. Um, you'd have a, you'd have a free market in money, right? And what would likely emerge is some gold or silver type money that you can trade electronically. And actually in, in other countries, um, if you if you happen to be not a U.S. citizen, so if you're one of the other 6.7 billion people in the world, uh, it's very easy for you to get a credit card that has two accounts on it. One of them is a gold or silver account, and the other one is the um, account of your bank deposit. And you can deposit, like HSBC does this if you live in Australia or Asia or something like that. They will have gold in a vault or silver in a vault, and you can buy however many ounces. And then when you go to the store and swipe your card, it says, do you want to pay out of your gold account or out of your Australian dollar account? And you just select which one you want to trade out of or pay for the goods out of, and it and the, mar- the transaction clears at the market price of gold. And so anywhere else in the world you're allowed to do that. In the United States, that's illegal. So what are you? I mean, what what are your thoughts on these? Uh, put, uh, you know, these proposals that are coming out now, more and more for states to to basically take you know take take charge and move forward and do this on they, their own. They they need to do it. Um, there's an interview that I would encourage all your listeners to read. It was uh, Casey Research. I think it was David Galland. He interviewed uh, Dr. Edwin Vieira. Mm-hmm. So if you just Google Casey Research Edwin Vieira, he talks about this. He talks about he says there's two things that states have to do if they're not going to follow the federal uh, government down, you know, down the black hole into the abyss. He says, number one, they have to start minting their own constitutional money. And if the federal government comes after them, they have to say no. They have to plant their feet in the ground and say, we are going to have honest money. And number two, he says the, the governors need to take back control of their National Guard from the uh, federal government. And he lays it all out. He goes through the history of money in the United States much better than I could he lays it out in very plain English. It's easy to understand. Um, so if you can, yeah, if you find that there on the yeah, online, I'll, you can link it I'll up. I'll find it and post it to my website. Definitely worth it. reading because it's basically he's saying, you know, that it's up to the states to save themselves, and it always has been. But it's just getting to, it's getting to the crisis point now where if they don't do that within the next couple of years, forget about it. And it's interesting to see who people who were proponents and versus opponents of sound money. Uh, ironically, you know, Alan Greenspan, if you go back and read in 1968, I think, 67, 68, he wrote a whole piece on why we needed to go back on the gold standard. Yeah, gold and economic freedom, I think is what it was called. And uh, yeah. it is a fascinating piece. I've read it. And then, I don't know if he drank the Kool-Aid or what, but like 10 years later, he flip-flops and becomes chairman of the Fed. And 
I don't know if it was just the paycheck or what was looking good to him, but all of a sudden he decided that they he could do a better job than uh, than the markets, I guess. Power corrupts. Yeah. And now that he's not in the Federal Reserve anymore, he's advocating he's advocating gold again, but kind of in a soft way. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to. You don't want to make his colleagues too upset, too right? Uh, all right, so we're talking with David Giesel, Campaign for Liberty. We've been talking to us about, about uh, sound money. we got about uh, four minutes left before the top of the hour. Let's go over to the phones and take some phone calls. Good evening. You're on the air. You need to turn your radio down there for me. All right, we'll try again. You there? Hello? Wait, hello? Yeah, it's you. Turn your radio down. Oh, okay, it's off. All right. Uh, listen, I'm not an economist, but I have a question. If you had a bag of money back when Nixon was in office, and uh, you converted it to gold, okay, you put it in your closet, the value of gold goes up and down. Yeah, it does go up and down, goes up. That's nice. But if you took that same money and you invested it in the market, how, much, how many dollars would you have now? Each dollar may have some diminished value, but you'd have a lot more dollars. Not true. Um, if you bought... That's, of course, the, the Wall Street pushes that on us. They say, oh, you're, you're stupid to own gold. And, and it's true, gold doesn't pay a dividend. Gold is a cash substitute, right? Gold is just money. It doesn't have a yield. It doesn't make profit. It, you know, if you, buy, if you buy shares of a productive company, they make stuff and they pay you a dividend. But if you bought, like, an index fund like the Dow or the S&P or something like that, and the, the myth is if you hold it long enough, no matter what, you'll make money on it. So um, I'm not sure about... You know, it depends on when in Nixon's administration you bought that. But let's let's look at say the last 11 or 12 years. So if you if you bought the Dow in 2000, it was trading at what 10,000, 11,000. Yeah, but it wasn't anywhere near that in 71. Yeah, but I'm just talking over the last 11 years. I don't I don't know what it was in 71. You can look it up. Um, so if you bought that, uh, you know, 11 years ago, you bought the Dow 11 years ago. You have maybe five or ten percent more dollars in your pocket today. Now, if you bought gold in 2000, it was 250 dollars an ounce, and today it's 1660 dollars an ounce. And so, you haven't really made money on gold. You've preserved your purchasing power. It's just the dollar has lost a lot of value, right, relative to the value of gold. All all the values are relative and subjective. Uh, but if you held the Dow, you you did just as bad as if you held cash. You know, you got taken to the cleaners. Um, so in 1971, you're talking about $35 an ounce gold, and today it's 1600. So that's uh, that's an appreciation of about what 200 times? Is that right? Or 20 20 times? 20 times. 20 times. So so 20 times. So uh, I don't know what the I don't know what like the Dow or the S and P was at in 1971. I'm not sure, um, but I don't know if over those three decades or four decades now. Uh, you would have seen the same appreciation. Now, of course, if you bought a, like a dividend yielding stock, right, then you get compounding dividends, and that's great. But U.S. stocks haven't had good dividend payouts for years. But the, the, and the difference here is is that your appreciation is still in dollars, it's which, still are, in still dollars, right? which so are still devaluing, which are still devalued. So right, and that's that's one of the things about about a credit money system or a debt based money system like we have here. And and I want to talk about that maybe in the next hour a little bit is. When you have, if you have a commodity-backed money, right, then it's some commodity, and its value goes up and down, just like anything else. But at least, at least you always have that commodity. If you have 100 ounces of gold, you always have 100 ounces of gold, right? But if you have, if you have debt-based or credit-based money, its value is subject to the whims of what the Federal Reserve sets interest rates at, and. And so you have to understand all these complex economics. You have to understand what real interest rates are, right? You have to l- say, okay, there's 2% inflation and the bank's paying 2.5%. So my real my real yield is half a percent, but then there's taxes on my gains. And it, it complicates holding cash. And so simple investors, the type of, you know, minimum wage type investors or minimum wage earners who just store their money in a checking account or a savings account and are used to just understanding interest, maybe, right, they get screwed in a debt-based or credit-based money system because they're not sophisticated enough to understand how to work the system. All right, I appreciate your call. Thanks very much. We're out of time. We're up against the hour. KFAR 660 AM, Fairbanks, Alaska. Fox News Radio is now. Common Sense Radio, the Michael Duke Show. Thanks for joining us. 458-TALK, 458-8255 is the phone number if you'd like to sound off. Now, for those of you who've been listening to the program today, we're talking about sound money. We're with David Giesel from the Campaign for Liberty. And uh, he threw out some uh, info out there uh, that I thought uh, you folks would be interested in. And so I posted some links to my Facebook page, 
first of all, that interview that he discussed uh, from Casey Research with Dr. Edwin Vieira. Uh, that is up on my uh, on my website right now in the Facebook box. You can find it. Also, two different videos, one from the Mises Institute, the Von Mises Institute, and uh, there's information. It's called Money Banking in the Federal Reserve System. And then another one, a speech given by Mike Maloney, uh, actually to bankers, apparently in Russia. Uh, it's amazing we can't teach this stuff here in America, but... Mike Maloney's over there in Russia teaching them all about it. It's a two-part video on um, uh, bankers, deflation, and gold and silver. Yep. And uh, so some interesting videos there, and uh, David asked me to put those up, so I went ahead and did that. 458-TALK, uh, 458-8255. If you have questions, now's the time to ask. We've been kind of quiet for the last hour here. Uh, David's been kind of giving us the whole rundown of what needs to happen. And uh, we're uh, taking your phone calls, 458-TALK, 458-8255. We uh, just cleared both lines that I had on hold here, so all four lines are open. If you would like to sound off, then uh, then now's the time to do it. David, let's talk real quick, and I'll throw out probably the most common objection that I hear to the idea of a, of a gold-backed currency or sound money is, uh, well, there's only so much of it. There's only so much gold. You can only create so much wealth, and then only then only only the wealthy will get wealthier, and, and there's no there's no room for anybody else to get wealthy. Right. Um yeah, that there's not enough gold in the world to go around, right? Exactly. Well, the, the scarcity is actually what makes gold a good money, and the fact that it's hard to find, right? There is a limited amount, and the above-ground supply of gold only grows by a maximum of about 2% a year. So that's one of the things that has historically given it stable purchasing power. And, of course, wealth is not money. Money is just a, a medium of exchange. It's just another commodity. Wealth is created when when people add value to something. If I mine aluminum and turn it into... An alloy, right? I've created wealth. Um, I've taken something of lower imputed value, you know, that humans value less, and I've made it of something of higher value, higher utility. And so, so money is not wealth. Money is just a medium of exchange. And so you can divide, you know, if you have a fixed supply of money or a very limited supply of money, you can divide it up as many ways as you need to buy whatever stuff you need. And so what's, what's happened historically under gold is as, as people sort of ran out of gold, they didn't actually run out. What happened was prices fell you would get more goods for the same amount of money, right? So for your one ounce gold coin or for your, your $20 double eagle, you would get more food or more energy or whatever uh, for your money if you just kept it in the bank. So it actually, that system um, incentivized saving because just by saving cash, even with no interest rate, you were able to buy more with your cash as as the economy grew. Well, and even that, you, you know, the, it wasn't like the gold disappeared. You just doubled down. You got greedy and you sold your gold. Right. I mean, you're just talking... Well, and even, you're, if, even if somebody hoards gold, right? There, there's nothing harmful you can do to anyone with money. If you hoard money, you increase the value of presently circulating money, right? If it, it, Say there's 100 units of money, and I hoard 90 of them, so there's only 10 units in circulation. Prices among people who are still exchanging will go down so that they can buy more stuff with the less less money that's in existence. Um, if I save money, right? Let's say I'm, I'm greedy and I don't spend all my money, right? Which supposedly stimulates the economy. And I put it on the bank or I invest it in stocks. Um, by doing that, by putting money in the bank, I lower the rate of interest. And so I, I create savings, which are the basis of loans for other businesses or for other individuals to build a house or, you know, start a company. And if I destroy my money, that's the only third thing I can do. Again, I decrease the amount of money in circulation. So everybody else who holds money has greater purchasing power because there's less money in circulation. It's Money is subject to supply and demand uh, in the free market if we had a free market money, just like any other commodity. And, and so there's nothing harmful that I can do to someone else with my own money, whether I save it, destroy it, hoard it, reinvest it, whatever. 458-TALK, 458-8255. Let's go over to the telephones now. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, good evening, Michael. Um, could you give us a little background about your guest? He sounds rather knowledgeable on this particular topic, but I personally know nothing of him. I've never heard the show on Saturday, and I really don't want to make this analogy, but a couple of years ago you had another young man on the radio that sounded very knowledgeable and, and very interesting in the beginning, and uh, that kind of went south. Yeah, don't, uh, I'll say it, it, relative to, to Schaefer, don't do anything that I'm saying and don't believe anything I'm saying. If if what, I'm, sa if what I'm saying is interesting... Just go and check it out yourself. Um, well, what is your background, sir? I, I have an engineering degree from UAF, and while I was doing my graduate uh, stuff, uh, you know, writing my thesis and stuff, it uh, I kind of got bored with engineering just because I was doing it every day. 
So I just took an interest in economics. Uh, Ron Paul sort of sparked that. And okay. I started reading economics books. And so then I got into the Austrian School of Economics and I read Mises and Rothbard and Bombarwerk and, and all of the classical Austrians and Hayek and, and uh, Henry Hazlitt and all these guys. And so I just started, you know, just consuming everything I could about it. And uh, and then I started going to uh, some of the economics discussions that that they have at the university and participating in those. And so that's that's basically um, my background in that. And then two years ago, I started a uh, economics book club where um, other people from the community and I will read books on economics or, or political economics, and we'll get together every two weeks and discuss it so we can kind of check ourselves. You know, we, we say, well, I took this from the book. Well, I think you're wrong, and we can we can debate and work that out. And so that's Sounds uh, good. essentially my background. Real good. Thank you much. Thanks for your call. Appreciate it. 458 Talk. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, it must be me. That is you. Oh, my name is Mark. Uh, I'd like to ask your guest uh, if he has any ideas on how we could extricate ourselves from this debt-based fiat currency issue that usury and get ourselves on a lawful substance of standard. Yeah, well, as far as uh, using the government to do that, I would say there's no chance. But uh, there's nothing stopping us from doing it ourselves. And if enough of us do it ourselves, it becomes... Uh, it becomes the new reality, right? So the number one thing you can do is say, you know, how do I get rid of dollars and buy something that's going to at least hold value or represent value? And that's really easy to do. There's a there's a great little coin shop down on uh, Second Avenue there. Um, and you guys, I would encourage people to head down there and check it out and talk to them. I'm, I'm not telling anybody to buy gold or silver. If you don't understand a asset or, or an investment, don't buy it understand what you buy. So if you don't understand how to buy gold and silver, go and talk to people. Those are great guys to talk to. Go online, check it out. Um, but take care of yourself. You know, get, extricate yourself as an individual first um, because then you'll be, you'll be on solid ground. You won't be worried about losing your, your money or anything like that. And then, then you can you know, maybe pursue uh, um, the governor or your representative in the house or something like that to get the state to do the same thing. Well, I've asked the state... Uh... Why we don't issue gold and silver coin on the state's treasury, and I've yet to receive a satisfactory answer. I'll get off the air and listen offline. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. Appreciate the, it. I don't think the state ever gives a satisfactory answer to any reasonable question that's we, asked. Of we it. had the governor in the studio here a while back, and uh, we were off the air during a break, and and I said to him uh, something along the line because I think we, there was just some discussions coming up. It was before Utah or anybody else had passed this stuff, but I had always had interest in. It. I said, why don't we talk about this? Why don't we talk about doing this? And, um, oh, he just looked at me like I had a third eye growing out of my forehead or something. You know, it was just, it was horrific. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty difficult to get them to actually move off the dime when they're so, I mean, they're so entrenched in the system, right? Yeah, well, totally. And, and the thing is, they have no incentive to understand, uh, economics. They're not dealing with their own money, right? They're dealing with money that they've taken from productive business in the state. Oil companies provide jobs. The state plunders the oil companies and then spends that money. It's free money to them. It's not theirs. It's a tragedy of the commons problem. So, so the state has almost no incentive to uh, to do anything that's in the long term financially wise. Uh, but we as individuals do, and that's that's the whole thing. If we're going to talk about individual liberty and individual uh, rights and things like that, that means we have to have individual responsibility for ourselves too. And so the the first step would be understanding the risks of of our action, like holding dollars is a risk, um, and we don't think of it that way. We think of, oh, if I buy gold, the price might go down. We don't think about if I buy dollars or if I hold dollars, that my value might disappear. So I think taking care of ourselves first uh, is what we need to do, and then maybe we can get some some politicians who know how to read. But I wouldn't hold my breath on that. All right, let's go over here. Good evening, you're on the air. Yeah, hi. Uh, I read not too long ago that. I don't know if it was Minnesota or Wisconsin or I think about 22 states actually are um, using different kind of monetary currency, not the paper dollar that we had, but they started their own currency. And, uh, you know, it's start, starting to circulate. And I looked it up on the Internet there. But also myself, I'm a small business owner, and I'm going to start getting uh, set up and locked on here to also – Except gold, silver, foreign currencies, which are stronger than ours. You know, and small businesses can do the same thing. Um, you know, yeah, get away from this dollar and we can start doing it because there is no law on the books that says we have to use the American dollar for a 
currency. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Um, and there, there are some people starting to do that. They're starting to take old, uh, so-called junk silver, old silver dollars, silver quarters, and silver dimes, at their melt value instead of at their face value. Right. And so, so I mean, you know, again, if we want, if we want to talk about bottom-up solutions, uh, that means the solution starts with us. So. All right, four five eight talk. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello. Hey, uh, great discussion. I'm enjoying this very much. Uh, David, I particularly enjoy the uh, historical perspective that you brought into this in the first hour. Um, I, I would add to this that, and maybe you covered this already, but it was about 1968, I think, that uh, Tricky Dicky Nixon took us off the gold standard, and it was about that period in time, once the United States was off the gold standard, that's when the deficit spending began. And so pretty much without any exceptions, except for a few years in the Clinton administration, we've had deficit spending. It's now the total U.S. debt's about $14.5 trillion. And obviously, we can't pay off that debt. It's just too too much. Every American would have to write a check. Last time I checked, about $40,000 per American. Yeah, that's, and, and it, that's absolutely true. Yep. And, and so the only thing they can really do is devalue the currency. And it's just remarkable. It is just stunning how deceptive they are in their approach. You heard, you heard Bernanke uh, in the last six months. They talk about quantitative <laughs> easing, too. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you just have to wonder, do they have like a study group sitting around saying, okay, how can we say we're going to screw the American people by devaluing their currency? How about quantitative easing, too? I mean, that sounds like a stool software, well, yeah, a gentle, it, effective overnight relief. You and know? now it's uh, QE3. That's the next discussion they already have it. Yeah, it, yeah. Gary North, in, in relation to your analogy, Gary North says that quanti- when he hears quantitative easing, he's reminded of trying to use duct tape to solve a diarrhea problem. <laughs> so, you know, I guess that, uh, two, one or two questions, David, and, and that is, obviously, you would expect, as they're devaluing the U.S. dollar, it's going to decline against the, U- the world currencies, and, and then we've certainly seen a decline against the Japanese yen. Uh, we're back, back to around parity with the Canadian dollar, but I, I guess my question is, yeah, how much inflation would you expect to see? Uh, that's one way of devaluing the currency or measuring the devaluing of the currency. Mm-hmm. Do you have any estimates or do you have anybody that you're reading who, who can anticipate how much the dollar is going to decline because of quantitative easing? Yeah, well, that's that's there's a million different estimates on that. Um, the An easy way to to look at that or what, and what Peter Schiff uses is he always talks about the gold to Dow ratio. So the Dow being at 11,000 means you could buy one share of the Dow for $11,000. And so he says, he looks at the ratio in terms of gold. How many ounces of gold at whatever the gold spot price is would it take to buy the Dow? And um, and so right now the ratio is like 7.6 to 1 or something like that. And whenever there's, whenever there's a high inflation scenario in a weakening economy, or at least historically, uh, like in the, in the Depression, which was deflationary but similar collapse in the economy, and then in the 70s, in 1980, the Dow to gold ratio bottomed out at one to one. So for one ounce of gold, you could buy um, all the companies. You could buy one share of all the companies in the Dow. And so that's that's sort of a metric I use to track inflation. Um, uh, but there's there's a lot of different ones out there. But but Peter Schiff is somebody uh, who I kind of look to for ways well, well, to, ways to gauge that. That, that's a good, certainly a good way to track inflation, but you have a way of anticipating inflation because, because to use that formula, you'd have to know what the Dow is yeah. four months from now or six months from now. That's, that's how would you anticipate? True. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know anything short term. You know, I don't know what the price of gold will be next month or at the end of the year. Um, Me neither. But yep. my anticipation is, uh, and and this this Michael Maloney presentation, he talks about debt money. As soon as you issue debt money, you can never pay it back because you have to pay it back with interest. Right. And so debt is going hyperbolic right now, right? Uh, the the amount of debt that the U.S. is issuing is going through the roof. So we're kind of in a quickening as far as inflation goes. And unlike the late 70s, there's no way out because the government has so much debt itself that if it raises interest rates like they did in the 80s yep. um, to suck that debt in, they won't be able to service the, the national debt. If there were 10% interest rates, the interest on the national debt would be $1.4 trillion a year, just the interest. But, but isn't it so, remarkable? And, and I don't know what the current... It's probably about half a trillion per year that we're paying right now in in debt service on mm-hmm. our debt. I haven't checked recently, but isn't it remarkable that the Chinese and the Germans and the Japanese, a lot of these big countries that are buying our debt, they're, they're sophisticated people. Why is it that they're still buying our debt? Because yeah, the, they know that the currency is going to be devalued in time. 
Yeah, the theory with China is uh, the Chinese economists that run their economy are uh, what's called neo-mercantilists. Mm -hmm. And so mercantilism was the idea that there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world and that money is is how you define the amount of wealth in the world, which, of course, uh, Adam Smith dismantled pretty thoroughly. Uh, but they sort of still ascribe to that. But I think they're losing their, their stomach for that ideology. <laughs> um, but they do continue to buy it. I think I think they're trying to ease their way out of it. Um, China is the world's largest gold-producing country in the world, and they buy 100% of their domestic production. They are also the world's largest importer of gold in the world, and they're buying. They buy up for like the uh, the Kennecott mine in Juneau. They buy 100% of the production of that. And so I think the Chinese are moving into gold and silver and copper and all sorts of things like that in a big way and slowly easing their way out of the treasuries market because they don't want to shock the treasuries market or they lose the value yep. of all the treasuries they already hold. And it's probably worth noting also that the Chinese will have the largest economy in the world in a number of years. They will surpass. I mean, it's, it's, oh, yeah. how sad is it that the communists are outcapitalizing the capitalists? Right. They do capitalism far better. They have lower tax rates. They have freer markets. It's yep. it's pretty sad. Great discussion, gentlemen. Appreciate yeah, the, the call. call. Thanks very much. 458 Talk. One last call for we're going to break. Good evening. Hello. Uh, yeah, quick question on the greenback dollar. Did, did Lincoln have that dollar, uh, greenback as a uh, backed up? with gold or did it end up that way or was it both it was supposed to be redeemable but they issued so many that they couldn't and so after the war they just denied redeemability they said you know you're, you're sol basically they eventually redeemed it or no they didn't uh the people who held greenbacks uh they lost their money i mean essentially huh. so I see and, a lot and of history books that don't get that far right that right well that well what they did see and this is something that actually obama was talking about in the 14th amendment it said that the uh, debts that the Confederacy incurred were not valid, right? So if you took inflated money from the Confederacy, you couldn't redeem that for gold. But the debts that the Union incurred were valid, uh, but they were not all paid back. It said that they were valid, but they weren't actually all paid back. And so some of them may have been redeemed, but not all. Right? Some so. were redeemed, but there was right there wasn't enough to they had they had overinflated. There wasn't enough to to redeem all of the uh, bills they'd printed. All right. So, so that was the first. That was the, it. Was funny that that you know Obama was talking about the Fourteenth Amendment as saying we have to pay our debts because the Fourteenth Amendment says that debts incurred are valid. But it, it, yeah, they're valid, but it doesn't say you can't default on them. It's like a mortgage. Right. A mortgage is valid, but it's a non-recourse debt, and so you can default on it and still be contractually uh, legitimate. The uh, value of gold spiked during the Lincoln's War, and then it went back down the steady line to. Uh, yeah, it, it, War One. it frequent. I mean, it almost always spikes during turmoil because people are looking for safety. And they, you know, historically, I think somehow or, or investors at least know that war destroys currencies. War destroys wealth. There's nothing about war that's productive. It's just a, a giant destruction of wealth and life. So, so, of course, gold is going to go up in the nominal sense during a war. Thank you for your call. 458-TALK, 458-8255. We continue ahead. David Giesel is our guest. We're taking your phone calls. Uh, Campaign for Liberty is who he's with. We are talking about sound money. What does it mean for us? Back with more. Don't go anywhere. Your money. All right, we're back. The Michael Duke Show, KFAR 660. David Giesel's our guest. We're talking about sound money. We got one phone call here before we uh, go back. David's got a couple things he wants to touch base on. Uh, let's go back to the telephones now. Four five eight eight two five five four five eight. Talk over here. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, this is Randy. Hey, Randy. Uh, I personally don't mind the fiat money system, uh, like Dave uh, pointed out. You know, just about all the countries have a fiat money system. However, as David also, as you pointed out, you know, there's a lot of abuses that can come out of it. You know, like if a Zimbabwe prince and just runs the print, printing presses 24 hours a day, you know, they can wildly inflate their currency. So you've got to use some. Uh, restraint and care and everything if you have a fiat money can, can, can i stop you real quick sure. so a fiat money system is declaring outright that half of the economy will be under socialist control that's what a fiat money system is so when you say you believe in a fiat money system that means you believe that half of the economy should be controlled from the commanding heights to use the term that uh, i believe lenin used is that are you a, are you a socialist randy no i do not want so how can you believe that half of the economy should be controlled by a room of men in dark suits. 
Well, if we have a fiat money system, it doesn't imply it does not imply that we have to have socialism. It does not. It, imply it does. It does. Fiat by definition is money by decree, right? It is not money that the market selects or that you and I can determine the value of in our exchange. It is money by decree. It is by definition decree of people who hold or claim to hold legal authority over other people. That is by definition what fiat money is. Yeah, I understand that. But what so, I was... so when you say you believe in fiat money, you believe that people, by decree, should be able to regulate the value of your money. Uh, well, yes, but on that. So point... that's socialism, Randy. That is believing that 50% of the economy should be socialized. But, well, let me just say, when you say socialism, I think of factories like a car company. Sure, yes. but what is what is the what is the most used commodity? I mean, cars cars exist as consumer goods, and you know there's control of oil and things like this. Like Hugo Chavez controls the oil in his country, and that's what makes him a, a socialist or a communist or whatever. But what is the most widely used commodity in an economy? It is the money. Control of the money. It would be the ultimate for any socialist. Yeah, yeah. I do not mind a government-controlled money system. Right, so you but, believe that half of the economy should be socialism. And that's that's fine. Like We can disagree on that. That's uh -huh. okay. But I just I just want you to understand that, that if you believe in fiat money and money by decree, you believe that half of the economy should operate under the command and control of oligarchs in a dark room. Yes, but let me just also slip in. All the factories in the country, the car companies, the widget factories, the bicycle factories, I believe those should all be privately owned. And that know? all of their savings and assets should be regulated by the government with no recourse. Well, I believe that that's what, money... That's what, you're, that's what you're saying. When yeah, you say the yeah. money system, the money system, money is the most important commodity in any economy. It is half of every transaction, Randy. It's, it's more than that because it's how we save, it's how we try to preserve our value, right? It, it's more than half of the economy. So if you advocate control over that, you're advocating more than half of the economy should be outright socialist. And that's an interesting viewpoint to take. But uh, it's not one I agree with, but um, if you are okay with that, then that's fine. Yes. Also, going to the Constitution, <clears throat> in uh, Article 1, Section 8, you know, it talks about this money thing, as, as you're aware, and it starts out saying that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, and then it goes on with what the Congress can do, and a little few paragraphs later it says, to coin money, regulate the ver value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. Now... On that point, I would say that it doesn't prohibit. You, you can tell. Maybe you've seen more about this. But yeah, this, it does. It does. does if not you read that, you have to read that in money. context, and you have to read it with a dictionary understanding what regulate the value thereof in 17 or 17 uh, what 87. What that meant then, and fixing weights and measures was regulating the value thereof. It was Congress's job to fix the weights and measures. And they did that almost immediately. They fixed, and, it, and it's never been changed. A dollar, a, a congressional, a constitutional dollar, if you want to define it that way, is 371.25 grains of silver. It still is, and it always has been. Yeah. Well, and, and, and Randy, I got to uh -huh. say that, I mean, David's, you know, David said he's going to, you know, respectfully disagree with you. I mean, I got to say, I, 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 I'm almost not respectfully disagreeing. I'm almost totally disagreeing. You're saying you support a fiat currency, yet there has not been a fiat currency that has survived. So what you're basically saying is you support the fact that your money system, your monetary system, is basically on the road to self-destruction, and you're okay with that. Well, no, I want it to be prudently taken care of. Oh, oh, okay, just, just we'll stop there because uh -huh. fiat money is always issued with debt. And so if you go to Michael's Facebook page and watch that Michael Maloney presentation, he explains why all fiat currencies die. From the moment that a dollar is is, is borrowed into circulation fr from the Treasury or from the, from the Federal Reserve by the Treasury, it's owed back plus interest. So from the moment that a Federal Reserve note was issued at interest, there was more money owed back than, the, than there was money in existence. And so as soon as they stop issuing new money, the amount of debt will exceed the amount of real money in existence, and all that you will ultimately be, le ultimately be left with is debt. The presentation on Michael's page totally explains that. I would encourage you to check it out and think about it. And, and trying to say prudence and government in the same sentence is really, I mean, you know, you would hope they would exercise prudence, but we've seen... Historically, not just this government, but pretty much every government ever in existence, uh, by the time they reach the 100-year mark, have no prudence left in them at all. They basically are working to serve their own interest or, or uh, prop up their own uh, fiefdoms or to justify what they're doing in the, in the existence. I mean, it's all well and good to have high hopes and ideals, but the bottom line is if you, do, if you, if you really are supporting a fiat currency and you're a student of history, you'll understand 
that that is a road to self-destruction eventually. Uh, thanks, Randy. Appreciate your call. 458 Talk over here. Good evening. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, good. This is a very good discussion. i got two questions. First, have you heard that foreign countries are printing more money and then turning around and buying gold? I have not heard that, but it's it could be true. It's likely true. Uh, to the extent they do that, um, of course, they're they're screwing their own people over by devaluing their money. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me if they were doing that. Do you know what the total debt in the world is? Is like when you figure our debt, Greece debt, and everything. I I don't know what that number is. I I know that there's figures on our debt that if you count Social Security and Medicare. And I'll remind your callers that Medicare Part D, which happened under, which was Bush's baby, is the biggest uh, liability of Medicare. With all of that rolled into the um, the uh, n- official national debt, I, I believe it's close to a hundred trillion dollars. So, I mean, the, the numbers become so big that it's not even worth talking about them. And the other question is, just think, what if we would have put all our money? From the permanent fund into gold and or silver. <laughs> yeah, just think. And just even now, if they would just do it, Texas kind of did it with their, I don't know if it was the education department or what, you know, they bought billion, billions of dollars worth of gold, something, some department. Oh, yeah, no, Texas. it was a, uh, there was a university in Texas that rolled like 10% of their uh, investments into a, a gold ETF. And, and then they took physical delivery. They actually have a yeah, vault, and they physically delivered it. Why, yeah. why can't the permanent fund do that? Uh, they could, but you're probably never going to get the political will to do that. Because on the one hand, it would be great for the state, right? Um, they would, you know, the, the fund would grow, or at least they'd preserve their money in this coming collapse. But on the other hand, it would it would sort of be uh, telling the federal government, we don't trust you anymore, and that would risk federal entitlements, and uh, nobody wants to give up federal entitlements. All right. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. 458-TALK, 458-8255. Good evening. Yeah, you know, when the Fed started, that's when we lost our country, and we absolutely need to end it because it's kind of like, why do men climb mountains, you know, because they're there? Why do fiat governments, you know, um, put a tax on the people and cause inflation? Because they can. Nobody even knows what's going on. So, you know, we're, yeah, war, we war is the biggest reason. Ago. War is the biggest reason that countries divest from gold. Um, in Western Europe... For uh, a couple hundred years, the the standard currency was always gold. People would trade gold across borders to settle debts, and of course, Europe was marred by war for hundreds of years, and and you know even into the 20th century. And whenever a nation went to war to conquer another nation, they would always uh, go onto a fiat money standard and stop redemption in gold. So war is the biggest reason that uh, that fiat money happens. So thanks. All right, appreciate your call. Thank you very much. Four five eight talk four five eight eight two five five. David, you wanted to. Yeah, I have a little. There, there was couple a couple things you wanted to. There was a caller who said, you know, how do you how do you keep track of inflation or try and project what it's going to be? And I don't I don't know what it's going to be in the short term. I just know there's there's going to be a lot of it. So on LouRockwell.com, there's a article, uh, debt ceiling madness, and Bill Bonner wrote it. It's up there today if you go to LouRockwell.com, and it says uh, he's talking about. They said. They're going to raise the debt ceiling by $2 trillion, but then they're going to cut spending by $2 trillion. So that sounds like a pretty fair deal, right? But they're going to cut that spending over the next 10 years. And so he says uh, from about $45 trillion, they're going to cut spending from about $45 trillion over the next 10 years down to $42.9 trillion, right? And that's a cut. They're going to increase the debt. Instead of increasing it by – instead of spending $45 trillion, they're going to spend $43 trillion. And somehow that's a cut. And that's in the next 10 years. So um, – Get ready for some inflation. Yeah, no, and you see that happening. All these bogus uh, accounting tactics, you know, how they account for things over the, oh, it's a $5 billion cut over the next 235 years, you right, know. Right, right. It's, like uh, it's like the valuations on dot-com companies. Yeah, yeah it's, well. It's, absurd. It's, just, it's actually more absurd than those. And I always remember the governor talking about, uh, you know, what, back in the, the days, I think, prior to Palin and everything else, was Murkowski and some of those other people talking about, oh, yeah, we cut the... Hey, we cut two hundred dollars. We cut, we cut, you know, twenty five or no, it's two hundred million. We cut two hundred million dollars out of the budget. What they didn't tell you was the proposed increase was three hundred and fifty million, and they cut two hundred of the three. So we're still going up one hundred and fifty million. It's you know, it's a cut to the increase of the proposed income. I don't know. Right. right. Uh, but that's where we're at. And and it, now you know the problem is, David. I think I think some people are paying attention. I think you know, Tea Party uh, folks are kind of getting it. I think there's some out there, but a lot of the mainstream people, they're just they're not seeing it. 
and maybe they just don't want to take the time to learn, or what's the problem? Uh, faith in government. That's the problem. And even amongst the Tea Party, there's a lot of people who are very wrapped up spending their energy trying to save the government. And and they're doing that, you know, for good reasons, but there's a lot of fear, you know, of, of what's coming down the road. And you can't make rational decisions from a place of fear. And so... I think, you know, the people who do see what's coming, I think the first, the most important thing for them to do is to say, okay, here, here's what I think is coming. Here's what I'm fearful of. How am I going to um, take care of that? How am I going to prepare myself so that I can act rationally when this stuff happens instead of panicking and, and you know, trying, just trying to get the next politician elected who's going to save us? Because we can only save ourselves and we've only ever been able to save ourselves. Politicians have never saved us from anything. And so I think, again, getting back to that, step one, you know, if we want to have a bottom-up movement, we have to take care of ourselves, and we have to act out of a, a rational, calm uh, state. And you mentioned politicians, and uh, is there anybody out there that's espousing, this is your setup here, uh, <laughs> is there anybody out there that's espousing this idea of a sound monetary policy? Yeah, there, there are two guys now, instead of just one. Whoa, whoa, yeah. wait a second, all yeah, right, there okay. There used to just be one, so there's, uh, there's Ron Paul, of course, and Ron Paul went into politics uh, when he saw Nixon go off the gold window. He watched that um, that uh, presidential presentation, and he was like, whoa, this is a big deal. Something bad is going to happen. And he's been ringing the alarm bell for, you know, 30 years. And he is the only, he is the only politician out there, at least in the, in the presidential race, and for a very long time in Congress, the Senate, anything else, who has advocated sound money and abolishing the Federal Reserve. And he is still the only one who does that. Um, some Tea Party politicians are, are talking about, yeah, we need to regulate the Fed or do this, but they don't actually believe that, that the Federal Reserve is the heart of the problem. Right. And then the other guy out there is his son, Rand Paul, in the Senate, um, who also believes that, that the Federal Reserve's got to go. There's also uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, the self-avowed socialist from Vermont. Right. He is against the Federal Reserve for the same, for the same reason, for a good reason. They steal from people. Um, and then uh, there was the, the guy from Florida who was in the the house west alan no no no, no. Uh, he didn't get reelected. Uh, grayson. grayson alan grayson yeah. was vehemently against the federal reserve for good reasons and i don't agree with him on other things but he was right the, the federal reserve is the heart of the problem if you don't understand the federal reserve you need to understand it if you want to start talking about any problems in this country it is the heart of the problem if it's not addressed forget about everything else we can just go home and watch it all burn four five eight talk four five eight eight two five five let's go over here Oh, good evening. Uh, that leaves all four lines open. We have four lines uh, open for you to call at 458-8255. Let me check the email. Email address, me at michaeldukeshow.com, me at michaeldukeshow.com. Looks like we're uh, free and clear there on the email. You were talking about, you know, how you mentioned Australia and how they have gold accounts and how they have deposit accounts and how they have those things. And, you know, we as Americans are denied that. But at the same time, we as Americans, uh, I think it was during the break you were mentioning, we have the opportunity here to be able to at least divest ourselves of some of these, you know, some of this fiat currency or, or uh, you know, some of these problems because we could still get durable goods, right, that will yeah. hold their value? Well, totally. I mean, not not only can you buy gold and silver coins, but you can buy food to store. You can buy ammo. You can buy weapons. You can buy vodka. You can buy cigarettes. You can buy, you know, you can buy a junk car that's the same as the car you're driving. So you got parts to fix it yourself. You know, there, there's all sorts of ways to, to hedge. You know, you could buy toilet paper for the next 10 years because you're going to need it, and it's going to be more expensive later, so why not just buy it now right. and and um, avoid the inflation that way? So there's a lot of ways. There's limitless ways for us to divest ourselves from the dying dollar. There are no ways for the government to divest itself. So we are we are actually the ones who don't need to worry. Us as individuals have, have all these options at our disposal to divest ourselves. Um, it's the government that doesn't, and... Uh, I, I think ultimately that will be a good thing um, because that's going to be the ultimate check on the government is when it's when it's money collapses. Right. It'll be it'll be rough for the people who are um, believing in government promises for food stamps or welfare or social people security. People are part of these those, social programs, right. right? And and some of those programs were they thought they were promised to them. You know, um, retirees now believed that social security was going to be there for them, and it is for now, uh, but. It's it's not going to be. And actually, the, on the Social Security webpage, there's a link, I would have to dig it up, where they say uh, Social Security is not a contract. It is not a promise to pay you. We can suspend payment to anyone at any time for any reason, period. And so, but people believe it is, and they're going to be left holding the bag. Because they've been forced to pay into it by law. Well, yeah, they have been forced to pay into it, right. 
And um, yeah, well, that goes back to the nature of government, which is force. Every, right. Everything the government does is by definition not voluntary because if it was voluntary. People would do it otherwise. People would do it without the government. Right. So, so Matt Damon could give more of his money to the government if he really believed right, right. it. Right. Actually, yeah, there's, there's a guy, Mike uh, Rosoff, who writes about the idea of voluntary competing governments. Right. Where, you know, if you wanted if you wanted to be part of a government system that had these safety nets and all these things, you could opt into it. Right. And you could say, well, I want to be part of this one and I agree to this taxation with these benefits and all that. Um, and he, he's actually laid out a pretty interesting theory of how that could work. But, yeah, and then the, 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 um, the people who believe in cheap love – not helping somebody, but just throwing money at them, they could pay as much as they want to whatever government they choose to be a part of. Ease their conscience. Right. Ease their conscience without actually going out and helping people. Right. 458-TALK, 458-8255 over here. Good evening. Yeah, I was thinking about all that money I pay into Social Security, but we don't get any tax on, or uh, sorry, interest on that, do we? No, it actually, it's never even saved. It's spent uh, the moment it gets there. There's no there's no trust fund. I mean, they, that's the, the myth is that there's a trust fund. Basically, the way the Social Security trust fund works is they have an account with zero dollars in it and they write themselves a check for two trillion dollars or whatever the amount of Social Security payouts is for the year. And they go to the bank and deposit it and they say, see, we have a check for two trillion dollars. That means we have two trillion dollars in our bank account. But they, they deposit the check, you know, into their savings out of a checking account that has zero in it, and so there's there's actually no money there. There's just a check that says $2 trillion. Yeah, it'd, be, it'd be like if you wrote yourself, yourself a check for a million bucks. It doesn't mean you're a millionaire. It just means you wrote a check for a million bucks. Yeah, I was just thinking about all the thousands of dollars that I put into Social Security and how much better I could probably grow that myself if I even went with a like a ridiculously low-risk deal like a CD in a bank. I would at least be able to increase my money you know yeah well, well even that, if you even if you stuffed it in your mattress you would have done better than social Security. well that's what and that's what congress believes i mean they yeah. exempted themselves from it so they could do their own thing you know i mean it's 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 okay for them but not for you state employees are also exempted yeah uh, well thanks mike <laughs> all right appreciate the call thanks very much four five eight talk four five eight eight two five five is the phone number we're down to the last five minutes or so david geisel is our guest we've been talking about sound money um, and uh, and now is the time to uh, now is the time to call it if you wanted to do it now, David. I know that you know in the past we you know we we were joking during the break and I always say my my thing is always the three B's right beans bullets and bullion and I always start with beans because I can't eat the bullion and I need the bullets to protect the beans and so that's where I'm at. But the bottom line is is there are ways that people even on a fairly limited income like I have no gold um, uh, are still able to get some precious metals or do some things out there. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, some rounds, some bars, but also junk silver and things like that. Seventy, what, 74 percent uh, melt value? Is that 74 percent silver? Or uh, it's 90 percent. Junk coins 90%. are 90 percent. But they, yeah, and they trade for, um, they trade for basically their full melt value, right, or, or close to it. But yeah. right, and 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 even gold, uh, you can buy fractional gold coins. You can buy tenth of an ounce gold coins, which are only 160 bucks. The the premium on them is a little bit higher, but. There's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to get into silver. You can go, you can go buy a silver dime for a dollar sixty cents. You know, so any, anybody on any income who has any sort of savings whatsoever, if you got, if you got five bucks a week left over, you can go buy some dimes every, every week. You know? Right now, what do you say to people who say, well, but silver's so high now. I mean, I should have bought it when it was eleven dollars an ounce. Now what do I do? It's now it's forty dollars. The, the question, yeah, the, the question isn't what the price of silver is. The question. Because silver has a price just like dollars do. Dollars have a price too. So the question would be, what would make dollars increase in value at this point? That's the question. Um, not what would push silver up or down. Because what you're what you're looking at in the precious metals is essentially the value of the dollar. What would make the dollar go up in value at this point? We have all this debt. We're kicking the can down the road. It'll never be paid back. Everybody knows it. Um, as soon as the foreign nations stop buying treasuries... The jig is up, and the Federal Reserve is going to have to print all those dollars. As soon as foreign nations stop using dollars for their exchanges as a reserve currency, those dollars will come flooding back into the U.S. There's trillions of dollars in Europe and Asia that never have set foot in uh, U.S. soil, so to speak. So what would push the value of the dollar up? I can't answer that question, so that's why I have gold and silver. <laughs> all right. 458 Talk. We're running out of time here. Good evening. Yeah, howdy. I was just wondering, with all this uh, talk of the debt ceiling and stuff like that, they, they claimed that all the bills would just stop flowing. I know personally in, in my world, if I run a little short on money, I don't go and ask for a larger limit on my credit card. I, 
I start making cuts and balances and stuff like that. Was there ever a real possibility that if the debt ceiling hadn't been raised, that a single bill would have not been paid legitimately? Um, not really. I mean, there's th- what they say is, oh, there's nothing we can cut. These are all essential services. Uh, but they're not really essential services. Like like the FAA right now is shut down. There's a, a if you go on Google News you can see that. But FAA traffic controllers are still in the tower. You know they're paid for through other means. Um, roads, you know DOT and and stuff like that. That's paid for through the gas tax. So roads would still be maintained. And so what services would go away? I don't know. I mean they never answered that question. They just had a bunch of fear. Um, the the head of the Park Service back in the 70s. Uh, Murray Rothbard writes about this. Whenever the Park Service didn't get, the, the, for the national parks, the amount of money they wanted, the first thing he would shut down is the Washington Monument because people from all 50 states visit it. And so then, 50, you know, 100 senators and 435 congressmen would get calls. Oh, they shut down the Washington Monument. So instead of cutting the stuff that's not necessary, they always threaten to cut stuff that people believe is necessary first. But it's it's just fear. If if they actually if the debt ceiling didn't get raised, they would have cut stuff that nobody even knows about. You know, they would have sent a bunch of bureaucrats home. Social security checks still would have gone out, food stamps would have gone out. Because so. those again are that's their political base. Right, exactly. And, and, it's fear. It's yeah. it's control through fear. All all politics and all this demagoguery is based on fear. And so that's why we need to be secure in our own investments and our own housing and our food situation so that we're not taken by the fear. It reminds me of when Tony Knowles was governor and he saved he saved one hundred and sixty thousand dollars by closing the road to Central. Yet they still paid three hundred thousand dollars to pave the back parking lot at the uh, over a DOT. I mean, you know, it's right. a, it, it, you know, it just doesn't, it, it, you know, oh, the world's gonna end. It's like cutting the music programs at school. Uh, David Giesel, thanks for coming in and joining us. Folks, want to find out more about the Campaign for Liberty? Um, you can Google uh, Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty. Uh, you can also go to PatriotsLament.blogspot.com. And um, all of those sites are, are linked from there. And then if you if you Facebook uh, Fairbanks for Ron Paul, you'll find our site there, too. And they're all linked into each other. So. All right, David Giesel, thanks very much. Tomorrow, open line, open forum. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you tomorrow.